welcome once again to EW10's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. It's Old Home Week as we welcome a great old friend of ours, Dale Alquist, author of the book The Story of the Family, G.K. Chesterton on the Only State that Creates and Loves Its Citizens, published by our friends at Ignatius Press, naturally available through our EWTN religious catalog. EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic. Oh, great to see you, Dale. Doug, it's good to be it, back it's here. A, it's amazing, too, because it's when we talk about it being like 10 years or something. 10 years. Ridiculous yeah. uh, here at EWTN, and it just seems like yesterday, uh, you know, it was back at the turn of the century, believe it or not, right? You started doing those series of programs on Chesterton for us. Yep, it was on for 15 seasons, and, and that, you know, the last live season was 2015, so right. we, we taped that before then, so that's been 10 years since I've been here. Right, absolutely, and uh, there were seven se seasons. We did a couple of book interviews, one on yes, your magazine, uh, Gilbert, which is still published, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, since you haven't been here cranking out programs, though we do have another program uh, with a protege of yours, somebody related to you doing Chesterton Station, what have you been spending your time on? Well, one of the main things that has taken over my life is uh, right at the time I was still doing the series here, we started a classical Catholic high school in Minneapolis where I'm from, and our intention was just to start one, mm -hmm. one high school because we wanted a place to send our own kids with a a classical and Catholic and affordable atmosphere. Well, that uh, that didn't quite take because these schools have just taken off. There's a little spark and now a fire has uh, spread across the prairie and these schools are popping up all over the country. We have uh, over 60 schools That's now amazing. open. Yeah. What, what's the average size of these, or does it depend upon how far along it is? In, 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 right, because they its always growth? start small, but they can start with just ten, our first school started with just ten students, but we have you know, now have 165 oh, really? students, and okay. and same thing happens with many of the schools. But some will start with 30 or 40. Is students. that over four and, years, three years? What's the? It, yeah, it's a four-year high school, and uh, and so the uh, it's you know grades grades nine through 12, but mm -hmm. usually. Um, they, when they start, they start growing pretty steadily. So uh, th th there's a lot of new schools. They, they have fewer students, but the ones who are well-established, right. well over 100 what do you, students. What's the attraction for that today, do you think? Well, there's, there's three things that, that pull them in, the three reasons why we started the school. One is that it's very, very faithfully Catholic. The other that it's, it's got a great integrated curriculum that really covers how to think, and we, we teach faith and reason, mm -hmm. and a, a well-developed philosophy program and arts program. And then it, it is affordable, which is one of the great scandals of modern education is that, you, you, you know, if we, if we can't be pro-family if we can't make it affordable for, for students. Right. So these, um, these schools are all started locally. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't start them. They're started locally. We give them the curriculum and the templates of how to run a school. And so parents have complete control of their of their children's formation, and which is the way it's supposed to be. It's the way it's supposed to be. Well, it's interesting too in reading through this book and the quotes and, and, and dealing with Chesterton on the family. You know, as you point out in the beginning, you know everybody would assume that Chesterton's not big on socialism, but he wasn't too big on capitalism either. Why? Well, because uh, in a nutshell. Uh, uh, capitalism is about the in interests of the individual. Socialism is about the interests of the community. And socialism got its name because it was a reaction against what was called individualism, which is what became capitalism. And neither of them care about the family. The family should be the center of the society, should be the basic unit. If we emphasize individual rights over the family, it undermines the family. If we in uh, emphasize the community rights, mm. it undermines the family. So. Uh, big business is is for Chesterton just as much a, a damage to the to okay. the family because it's it's something remote and centralized right. and, and initially pulled the male or the husband out of the family rather than being kind of a family farm or family right. business where everybody was working together right? and then pulled the the mother out the of the family too so they, they both right. got pulled out right. yeah exactly yeah. now in the prelude here you talk about defending the triangle why are you into uh, you know geometry well, uh, if you if you tr if the triangle rebels <laughs> and wants to become something other than a three-sided uh, geometrical shape, Chester says its life c comes to a lamentable end. The mm -hmm. definition of the triangle are the three sides. Well, the family has a definition, and if you try to change mm -hmm. the definition of the family, it too comes to an end. And there's a pretty clear definition of what it is. It's father, mother, and child. Mm -hmm. That's the that's what the family is. Now, obviously, you, you can lose a father, you can lose a mother, you can lose a child, 
but they're they're known for the fact that they're missing part of the family. What's interesting with, with, with reading through Chesterton's commentary on this stuff, going back, let's say, 100 years, a uh, little 120 years to 100 years, that, t that time period, so many of the things he talked about, uh, obviously, was prophetic. Yeah. He saw what was coming, but also, to some degree, it's surprising how many of these things were percolating back then. That, that is surprising. I mean, he, he realized that there was this move towards easy divorce. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing he saw as damaging to the family and he said that's he said the result of frivolous divorce will be frivolous marriage right. well we're seeing the results of that right now is frivolous marriage but he also knew that there was this attack on life itself he, even then there was discussion about what was then called birth control which is you know we know as contraception Chesterton said that, that would lead to abortion it would lead to infanticide it would lead to euthanasia right. he, he, you know all this all the very same things that Pope St. Paul VI warned about in Humanae Vitae. Yeah, 30-something 30, yeah. 30 years after he said Yeah, Chester was saying the same things. Right. You say in the beginning here, it's difficult to defend the obvious. And you say the family is a perfect example of something so obvious, it's difficult to defend. Explain. Well, if I told you, Doug, defend civilization. Tell me why civilization is better than savagery. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you'd look around for, well, there, uh, well, there's that chair over there. There's that piano. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you just try to think of, of such an obvious thing. Of course we want civilization as opposed to savagery. Well, defending the obvious is, is something that we assume to be true because we haven't thought mm -hmm. about it. it. It's what we used to call common sense. You remember that term? Right, that we, right. we had a television show yeah, called that. Yeah. yeah, so common sense is the thing that we have to remind people of it to, so that they know that it's it's true and they go, oh yeah, that is right. true. Yeah. Now the Apostle of Common Sense, that was the name of the series. Yes. Where did that moniker come from? Well, you're looking at the guy whose okay. moniker. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we came up with that one because it, it, it defined Chesterton perfectly. Yeah. Right, so you were the one who, yeah, who yeah. did that. You talk about here the idea of broken families and you talk about Chesterton, hardly anybody outside a particular religious grant dares to defend the family. The world around us accepted a social system which denies the family. Why did we move in that direction? Well, I, I'm gonna, the, the first answer is the devil, okay? Mm -hmm. The devil attacked the most basic relationship in, in all of humanity. First, the relationship between husband and wife, man and woman, and then the relationship between mother and child. Mm -hmm. And if, 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 uh, if we let that fail, uh, this whole society comes apart. So in order to have a strong society, you have to have a strong family unit. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and so the weakness of a, of a failing society is going to start with when a fa when families start failing. Which it says, political follies are only a result of cultural follies, such as feminism, which Chesterton defines as women trying to be men. And it goes on to the idea, such follies have led to our recent fixations on gender confusion, right? Uh, which obviously we've seen. And then you say the revolt of women against men has fueled the revolt of men against women. Yeah, surprising, isn't it? But the, their, you know, feminism had a reaction, which was uh, an increasing disrespect of women. Uh, if men and women are in their proper roles, men not only respect women, they, they actually hold them up on a pedestal because they are the most special of all creation. Uh, when, when women try to be men, mm -hmm. uh, men are naturally lazy, Doug, and they <laughs> said, okay, well, yeah, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Right, right, right. So, it makes it much easier. Yeah, it's a lot easier. And so men became less gentlemen because it's, it's hard work to be a gentleman and uh, it's hard work to be courteous. Right. And so men just stopped all that. You say at the most basic level, the child is an explanation of the father and mother. What do you mean? That's a great line. The child is the explanation of the, of the father and mother. It's a good Chesterton twist. Mm -hmm. But the reason a child exists is because there's a father and a mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, one of those basic things we don't, we don't think about. Why does that child exist? Well, because there's a father and a mother. And th well, that's what a family is. Mm -hmm. and, and if we stop protecting the family, we have children who are suddenly missing a father or a mother. They and start missing. Uh, we're a, a, seeing the effects of that exactly. in our society. Yeah, uh, exactly. With, with so many mm -hmm. unwed mothers and, and households without a, a father. You say, yeah. whenever the family falters, there's only one entity with enough help to fill the functions. Who could that be? The state. Absolutely. The state. And, and that's what we've really seen is, and Chester warned about this. He says, the state will start insinuating itself into every aspect of our lives as soon as we lose the authority of the family. 
and the, the state will become the substitute mother right. and the substitute father and uh, will become the major social influence. And of course, the public schools are the, are the prime example of that because they've taken away, they've just driven a wedge between, right. between parent and child. That's right, absolutely. Doing. Chesterton says that the reformers do not understand the basis of the thing they are trying to rebuild. You cannot break apart the basic unit of civilization, which is the family which is what we're doing. We got that nuclear family, we got rid of that. We don't like that. We don't like nuclear energy. We don't like nuclear families. So they went out the door. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, it's a variation of, uh, of a now part of the common parlance, which is called Chesterton's wall or Chesterton's fence. Mm -hmm. uh, people, right. people who don't what even know great, what Chesterton is yeah, know that. Know that. You they, hear that all the time now. People yeah, use that, yeah, right? yeah. Why, you can't tear down something if you don't know why it was, it was built. was there, right. Figure that out before you decide to get rid of it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Because somebody put it there for some reason. Right, and there's a reason why the family is the family, but people are attacking it without knowing what it's for. What's officialism? Officialism is, is you know, a function of the state. When the mm -hmm. state uh, tries to, to make everything official, to it's, it's my, just tiny, uh, minuscule regulation of everything, and uh, it is this false authority that comes from the state. Officialism is a good word. You use it in a sentence when I, you get a chance. I, I will do the best okay. I can. 1936, I can't believe he was talking about, you know, sexual emancipation, because we don't think, we think it's like we discovered it in the 60s. Right. Um, but it, it's the frightful punishment of mere sex emancipation is not anarchy, but bureaucracy. Isn't that an amazing incident? Now think about this. This is a variation of Chesterton's line, if you break the big laws, you don't get freedom and you don't even get anarchy, you get the small laws. We live under a tyranny of small laws mm -hmm. because we've broken the big laws. And sexual emancipation has given us the small laws so that what was certainly common sense because you, you would just follow basic morality, mm -hmm. now all these things are regulated by bureaucracy so you can't say a certain term that will be offensive mm -hmm. to somebody. You can't run a business unless you're doing this, this, and this to protect a section of the population that common sense says they should be able to take care of themselves without some law mm -hmm. coming here and protecting, without the, the state bringing all its forces on us. And we just, more, more and more levels of bureaucracy are created which are right. an attack on freedom. Right. You said, and I thought this was an interesting connect with, at a certain turning point in history, there arose another institution that came to the defense of the family, and that was? The Catholic Church. But when, when, when the church made marriage a sacrament, right. we, you know, a, a reflection of God's own relationship with us and, and Christ's relationship with us, that made the family a, a sacred institution. Chesterton says, it's one of the first lines mm -hmm. I quote in the book, the, the the Catholic Church has always been a domestic religion. It started with the Holy Family. Mm -hmm. Now, you compare Thomas More and Chesterton. Why? Thomas More, in his time, uh, was defending not only the faith, but he was also defending the family. Mm -hmm. When he opposed Henry VIII's divorce, he was, he was protecting the institution of marriage mm -hmm. and protecting the Catholic uh, sacrament as well. And that uh, it wasn't up to a man, even if he's the king, to uh, interfere with God's law for marriage that, that you know, s the sacrament lasts forever. Mm -hmm. and, and so Chesterton says that Thomas More is more important now than he was in his own time mm -hmm. because he was not only defending the, the church against the state, he was defending the family against the state. And he also said Thomas More will be more important in the future than he is now. And I think you know, we, we've seen Thomas More invoked more and more right, because of those two things, defending the family and defending the church. You say the war on the family begins with the attack on marriage, then on the Marriage Act, then on children, first through killing children in the womb or on the delivery table, then by killing the innocents without killing the child. I thought that was interesting. And then on the soul through an education system that has banished God. So th that line, killing the innocents without killing the child. That's, that's what we're doing when we've, when we've absolutely exposed innocent young children mm -hmm. to uh, sexualized messages that uh, are, are absolutely really beneath contempt. And they, they are. When you're killing the innocents, you, you, you're losing a child. Yeah. 
you talk about the opening sentence of the everlasting man is there are two ways of getting home and one of them is to stay there yeah that's a good line um and um uh, you know we we wouldn't have the the odyssey if if odysseus had just stayed home mm -hmm. it, you know it'd be it's, it would be a good story of of domestic bliss but uh the, the journey uh, the, the object of every journey the goal of every journey is to get home uh it was my story with the Catholic Church, right? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was actually in Rome when I first started thinking about become, becoming Catholic, and I had to go all the way around the world mm -hmm. to get back to Rome again, to get home. And, uh, you know, home is where we're supposed to be, but we sometimes have to leave home in order to get there. Right. Well, there's a lot of sirens in our own society that I think pull people <laughs> and, and drown out the voice of God, right? In a kind of a good in a image, way. a very right, good right. image. Yeah. False yeah. science and quack psychology is being used to destroy that natural authority and Christian tradition of the home. Now he said that in 1921, not in 2021. Right. False science and. What, quackery? Quackery. Yeah, Quack yeah. psychology. Psy Quack psychology. Chesterton's yeah. great line about psychoanalysis is that it's the uh, confessional without absolution. Right, right. Yeah. And, and just think of how both of these things are an attack on, on getting us to admit sin. Right. And uh, if there's no sin, well, then we don't need priests. We don't need yeah. confession. Exactly. Yeah. And then. Which is why you, I yeah. wonder why some elements of the church are pushing something that puts them out of business. I don't quite get it. Yeah, but. it's it's really amazing. And, and then of course, what are people going to do with all the guilt and all the suffering they're doing from their sin if they do, if they're not able because to confess they know. it? Yeah. Deep in their heart, the, the, they, that, they, that's they, act, that is a problem. Yeah, Chesterton mm -hmm. says, you know, a, a man who wants to confess his sins is as is like a, a thirsty animal looking for something to drink. Right. You know? In the in the section love and sex, the moment sex ceases to be a servant, it becomes a tyrant. So that was from an unusual source. That was from his book on St. Francis of Assisi. Right, and that. he absolutely nailed something that uh, is we are suffering from right now in our society, that sex has become a tyrant because we've lost what the purpose of sex is. Mm -hmm. as, as soon as it stops being a servant, which is, it's a servant to marriage, to love, to fatherhood and motherhood, to the family. Mm -hmm. As soon as it loses that position, it becomes a tyrant and People become obsessed with it, they become oversexed, and they become perverse. Right, absolutely. Though a proper Noah's Ark should contain two species of specimens of every animal, nobody had proposed that it should contain two Noahs. <laughs> so Chesterton, in a day where you weren't allowed to, it wasn't just, it simply wasn't proper to speak openly about homosexuality. He had a very good line there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, t it's you have two of everything, but you don't have two Noahs. He has another line uh, on the same thing. The, the time of Oscar Wilde was was the uh, the, the, the image of um, of the green and yellow called gay movement mm -hmm. was um, uh, the lily. Mm -hmm. And Chester says the purpose of the lily is not to be beautiful. The purpose of the lily is to make more lilies. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> The essence of romance, all romance consists of three characters. For the sake of argument, they may be called St. George and the Dragon and the Princess. Please explain. Okay, so every good story has the thing that must be fought, mm -hmm. the dragon. It has the thing that must be loved, the princess. And it has to have the thing that loves and fights, St. George. And he says fighting without loving is simply uh, horseplay, but loving without being willing to fight is lust. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and that's what makes every story great. You have to have that tension that the hero is protecting the thing he loves mm -hmm. and he's fighting the thing that wants to destroy the thing he loves. Uh, the decadence used to say that the things like the marriage vow might be very convenient for commonplace public purposes, but had no place in the world of beauty and imagination. The truth is exactly the other way. The truth is that marriage, if marriage had not existed, would have been necessary for artists to invent. Because love, when it's love, wants to sacrifice itself. It wants to give everything for the beloved. And uh, that's not an invention. That's a, a natural process through the, to the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. So um, Chester was taking on the, the modern skeptic and the modern agnostic and said, no, no. 
look at anyone who's in love. The first thing they want to do is bind themselves together. Mm -hmm. That's what they want to do. Love wants to give itself up for the beloved. Going back to our early discussion about economics, the madness of tomorrow is not from Moscow, but much more in Manhattan. Yes, so he's talking there specifically about the sexual revolution. He mm -hmm. says the next great heresy will be an attack on morality, especially on sexual morality, and that's when he says the line, the madness of tomorrow is not in Moscow, but much more in Manhattan, because that's going to be the source of this, this attack on sexual morality. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, he, he had all the, all the right criticisms of communism, which is, you know, it's right. war against God, it's war against the dignity of, of man, but capitalism, with its gross commercialism, just appealed to the people's right. worst, worst uh, tendencies, and, and it did that especially well, it, in terms it, of sex. It, it needs a Christian culture's attenuation to Absolutely. manage it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It may be a piece of very silly sentimentalism to represent the world as full of happy marriages, but to represent the world as full of happy divorces seems to me m so much sillier and much more sentimental. It is. Uh, people people uh, say uh, when their marriage fails, well, they're, they're going to be they're going to be happier if they divorce. Well, Chester says you don't have a world full of happy divorces. And yet, yes, every marriage is a struggle. Every right. marriage is Absolutely. a struggle. But uh, in life is a struggle, too. Right. <laughs> and, and so just because a marriage has a struggle doesn't mean the marriage has failed. Uh, right. In, in the David Copperfield uh, th uh, quote here, uh, from, from Chester, most marriages I think are happy marriages, but there is no such thing as a contented marriage. The whole pleasure of marriages is that it's in perpetual crisis. The whole pleasure of marriage is that it's a perpetual <laughs> crisis. That's a great line. Uh -huh. Be sure you mention that to your wife today. Yes, uh, uh, right. I think she understands okay. it already. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he also goes on in, in the section on marriage and divorce, say, uh, the modern notion about the state is a delusion. It is not founded on the history of real states, but entirely on reading about unreal or ideal states like utopias, or then he takes a shot at H.G. Wells here. Yes. Mr. Wells. H.G. Wells, uh, you know, he and Chester were amazing, good friends, yet they disagreed on absolutely everything. And it's a testament to Chester mm -hmm. that uh, he did maintain such a great friendship with someone who was totally opposed to Christianity, right. totally opposed to the idea of God, totally opposed to the idea of marriage, and right. yet they maintain a friendship. Uh, and, and yeah, H.G. Wells was always talking about, you know, these, these perfect plans, these right. perfect governments, and yeah, yeah. none of those things exist, and there's no basis for, the, for them having ever existed. Right, and, and trying to contact and talk to the dead, too. Yes. Uh, a divorce is not an emancipation, it's a veto, because it is a veto on the most human of things vows, and impudent Imprudent marriage is one of the few entirely free things which poor men is still free to do. You know, the whole idea of a vow is that you enter into it voluntarily. And, and Chesterton is granting us our dignity by taking the vow seriously. And uh, Chesterton says, when a man makes a vow, he's making an appointment with himself at some time in the future. Right. I admit that the sort of men who make out make our laws can be trusted to do one thing, to unmake our marriages. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, Chester didn't have a high view of politics, but you know, when, when the political system starts to undo basic human connections like marriage, Chester says, yeah, he has even less, less confidence in the political process at that point. For us moderns, therefore, the first philosophical significance of the play, and this is uh, Macbeth, I thought it was interesting to talk, that our life is one thing and our lawless acts limit us. Every time we break a law, we make a limitation. In some strange way, hidden in the depths or the deeps of human psychology, if we build our palace on some unknown wrong, it turns very slowly into our prison. You know, Chester's essay on Macbeth is one of the great essays in that book. And he talks about the fact that Macbeth tries to break out, and anybody who tries to break out um, they only get themselves into a smaller, smaller prison. Uh, he says to get to get rid of the temptation by giving into it, not only doesn't get, make you free, it doesn't even get rid of the temptation because you, you have to sin more and more to cover up the first sin. Right. And it ends it ends in madness. And he says, you know, where it ends, you can read at the end of Macbeth. He in says. babies and and, and uh, birth control, I have often wondered how the scientific Marxisms Marxians 
and the believers in a materialist view of history will ever manage to teach their dreary economic generalizations to children. But I suppose they will have no children. That's where we are, right? That's exactly where we are. There's been this war on children, uh, and uh, who, who are we going to pass all these great truths that we've discovered onto if we've stopped having children? He also says uh, near the end of the book, uh, we have the misfortune to live in an age of journalese in which anything done inside a house is called drudgery, while everything done outside the house is called enterprise. So Chesterton says the inside of the house is larger than the outside of the house. It's the outside world that's narrow, and we are supposed to be preparing our children to be parents themselves. We're supposed to be preparing them for the home. The home is supposed to be the center of our daily life and the center of, right. of life itself. Okay, how's the book doing? Well, um, I know that you've read it. Yeah, I certainly have. Well, I can't, I can't ask for much more than okay, that. Okay, well, I, another book in the works? Yes, yes, I've got, got a new edition of The Everlasting Man coming out and uh, a book on localism, and uh, there'll be a, a new alternative autobiography of G.K. Chesterton okay, coming well, out. Okay, yeah, well, don't be such a stranger, you know. We always love to have you here, always Dale. It's great to here. see God you. God bless you. Dale Alquist, the story of the family G.K. Chesterton on the only state that creates and loves its citizens. Totally true. Nation's Press, available through our EWTM religious catalog. Don't forget about the Chesterton School Network.org as well. Check that out. I'm Doug Kack. Join us next time right here on Bookmark. Thanks.